Brother Nuri Muhammad, student minister of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, first, thank you for joining me on my show. And number two, thank you for allowing us to do it here. Beautiful Muhammad Moss, number 74, Indianapolis, Indiana. How are you, sir? Man, I'm fine, Brother William, and I'm honored that you and the team would um, make your way to, to the Nappy City to do it from here. This is your home, yeah. away from home. So anytime you're in the area, you know, come through, we'd love to have you for anything that we got going on, my brother. But it's an honor to be on the airways with you and share space and time with you. Wow, that's greatly appreciated. I've been following you for about two years now. Uh, you, you first were on my radar when, in like a two week span, you appeared on some of my favorite media outlets. Mm -hmm. You had called into the Joe Budden podcast, and right. shortly after that, you were on The Breakfast Club with Charlemagne the God. How did that Breakfast Club appearance come about? Well, you know the traditional uh, Negro introduction. What had happened was, <laughs> <laughs> well, what had, what had happened was, right. uh, we originally were coming out there for the Joe Budden podcast uh, because of the uh, recycle of the lie of the murder of Malcolm X that was on the Godfather of Harlem and the kind of uh, stir it had produced. And one of the uh, members of Joe, Biden, Joe Budden's staff had made a statement about, yeah, you knew, you know, so, so forth. So we kind of uh, pre presented it to him and he said, yeah, I will let him, I will have him on and uh, we can clear this up. So that's how it happened. And then while we were there, uh, we started communicating with uh, Brother Charlemagne, who was, he was actually helping to facilitate us with the Joe Budden podcast. And then he said, Brother, well, how, when are you leaving? Right. I said, well, you know, a couple of days, come, why don't you come? So that we did that and we also did the uh, Vlad. What did that appearance on The Breakfast Club do for your public profile? What was some of the feedback? Because as I'm now learning, some of those mainstream media outlets, and that's iHeartMedia, yeah. they're a little hesitant to share the airways with individuals from your organization, the Nation right. of Islam. Well, it, it, of course, it had a positive impact because you, you're tapping into uh, a different audience than you normally tap into. Traditionally, you are going to, it's just like any station. You turn to a station, expect a certain style of music. Uh, if it's country, if it's jazz, if it's classical, if it's hip hop, that's what you expect from that channel. So a lot of people that uh, were already in contact with me, uh, read my books, seen lectures, these were people that were from the quote unquote conscious community that had an affinity for a revolution or an affinity for black uh, power in the truest sense. So we had that audience, but you have that with Breakfast Club, you have those same kind of soldiers, but you also have a lot of the young warriors that are not necessarily considered the quote unquote conscious uh, and the impact where now, of course, it's you know, over a million some odd views and we receive, uh, I'm gonna say thousands of messages, wow. direct messages from many people all over the world that have renegotiated their contract with life. Some on the brink of suicide, seen that and made a shift. Some, you know, in the streets hustling, changed. Some uh, abusing their, their wives, changed. So it it's, was a great platform that allowed us to get access to some of the audience that we may not have touched yet uh, in our work. And that was the blessing. Wow. I was definitely part of that audience, and uh, as I mentioned, I've been tuned in ever since, not just to you, but some of your other brothers and sisters yeah, in the Nation of Islam, consuming uh, the lectures, the scholarship that's produced, the clips wow. on YouTube. So definitely, um, I, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Brother Nuri. Yes, sir. 2016 Savior's Day, the minister, Louis Farrakhan, gives his address to his people, and in that address, he kind of warns, hey, don't go back to the community building basketball courts Damn. and think you're doing something for the neighborhood. Man. You know, the basketball court is similar, a breeding grounds for a basketball plantation. Mm. He goes on to say the evaluation process that ha happens in sports, you know, owners, general managers, they look at players, oh, this one is strong, this one is swift. They poke and prod. Yeah. Is akin to what they used to do to us 
on the on, slavery block. Yeah, on the auction block, that's right. So brother Noy, help me. How can sports be akin to slavery if our athletes make hundreds of millions of dollars? Well, it, and there's a brother that wrote a book some years ago called The $40 Million Slave. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but in the book, uh, he shows that there is a, a broad gap between money in your pocket and wisdom inside of your mind. And slavery, by definition, is one that has voluntarily submitted to a so-called superior power and has lost their power of resistance. So when you look at the math by definition, slavery has nothing to do with how much you have in the bank account. You can be a rich slave or a poor slave. You can still be a slave. So whenever the minister uh, highlighted that, he was showing, number one, we've got to have a new definition to what community service is. Community service, we, we still are using that old, ancient Negro civil rights template for everything we do to fight for freedom, justice, and equality or do for self in our community. So community service means giving blankets out, bottles of water, free food to the homeless, and, and et cetera. But the real community service, you know, as the old saying goes, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So that uh, uh, the minister was trying to, to angle our minds as servants of the people. Don't go out there and think that you did something because you gave somebody a blanket or you gave somebody a turkey dinner. Do something that can empower them that they can get up out of their condition and do for self. And then, of course, you know that right now there's a little over one million black boys playing high school basketball in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. All of them are aspiring to be in the NBA. They sure are. But out of that one million, only 35,000 of them will even go to college and play basketball. And out of that 35,000, only seven of them will be able to secure a starting job in the NBA. So you got one million black boys competing for seven full-time jobs. I don't know about you, but that sounds like bad math to me. So what the minister was telling us uh, in 2016, and of course in many of his messages, is that God doesn't create hoopers. Anybody that you see proficient in a sport, that is just the result of the natural willpower, focus, fight, drive, and discipline that they have built in them or that they were trained to acquire. But they are born to be something bigger than that. So whatever you see LeBron doing on the court, he could do better than that on a, in a different field. Whatever you see Ezekiel Elliott doing on the football field, he can do even more in the engineering field or the field of chemistry. So, so the minister is telling us to make sure that when we invest our energy, do something for nation building. Find a transferable trade that you can involve yourself in that whether you in power or the white man is in power, you will be able to do something good for your people and not become a $40 million slave. Brother Nuri, when I f first heard the minister speak, like. But isn't it about the bag at all costs? Don't we need this money mm -hmm. to help with the community? Not at all costs, you know. And, and I'll say it in these words. This is Jesus saying this. He said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world, but he lost his soul? So the spiritual bank account with God is more important than the physical bank account with man. Do you need money? Yes. You know, there's a verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes 10, 19. It says that a feast is made for laughter and wine maketh one merry, but money answereth all things. So, you know, money is money is not everything, but it's right up there with oxygen. If that makes any sense. Yes, the problem, though, whenever we say. The bag the by bag. any means necessary. Now. We're saying that we'll do anything for it and we have to be careful Anytime you meet a person that will do or that thinks that money is everything, they'll normally do anything for it, including violating 
laws, rules, and their own people. So by any means in accordance with the law, that doesn't compromise your morals or your integrity or take advantage of other people or trod on their rights as a human being, by those, by any means other than that, we, we have to have the bag. But technically, but we, we do have it. We have the bag. We do. 1.3, listen to me, trillion dollars came through black people's hands in 2020. 1.1 trillion came in 2019 and 2018. That makes black people in America, in the scale of comparing us to 226 nations on earth, we are the eighth richest nation on the planet if we was independent. Mexico only brought in 637 billion. Spain only brought in 700 billion. Mexico got 130 million people taking care of a 700,000 square mile landmass. Spain got 46 million people. They taking care of 208,000 square mile landmass. They got all that land, the same amount of black people that's in America, 46 million in Spain. Mexico has triple that. Yet they are able to maintain an independent nation with half the money we have. So something wrong, something wrong. So, so it's not that we need more, it's that we have to use it better. We got the dollars, we just need the cents that goes with the dollars. We've become the leaders in unnecessary spending. You know, that, that's buying stuff we don't need from people that we don't like to impress people that we don't even know. That's, that's, what, that's, our, that's our problem. So we spend the money that we don't have. We're, we're, we're doing things and we, we, are the, we are consumers. So when the math is done, $1.3 trillion, yet we still only have 2% of the wealth. And, you know, income and wealth are not the same thing. Income is when you exchange your time to earn money. But wealth is what you exchange that money for that either keeps its value or increases in value over time. We're spending our money on stuff that doesn't keep its value or increase in value over time. So we got the dollars, we just need the cents. Technically, as a people, we already have gotten the bag. We just gotta know how to use what we have in that bag a little bit better. That's interesting that you say that because I look at the sports landscape no blacks are in position of ownership besides the great Michael Jordan. What role does the athlete play in this arrangement, this continued arrangement of just being a labor force and not being a part of management? Because you mentioned they're getting a five hundred million dollar contract, they're right. getting the sponsorships and the deal, but they don't want any more, anything else. Right. They're not fighting for anything else. Well, you know, it, it's so deep because it's it's. All that we see, again, is, is rooted in a deep, unspoken self-hatred we have for ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's an axiom in the world of psychology that says this, that the strongest force in the human psyche is the need to behave congruent with the way one identifies themselves. Because we don't see ourselves as being what we really are. We are the original people of the planet. We're the makers, we're the owners. We're the father and mother of all art, science, and civilization. We're the cream of the planet Earth. We're really the gods of the universe. But because we don't see ourselves in the fullest scope of, the way, of what we are, our expectations of ourselves are so low. So we really think that it's good enough that I'm on the court, it's good enough that I'm able to take care of my little self and my little family and drive nice and live nice and ride, ride like I wanna ride. That's sufficient. Why? Because the strongest force in the human psyche is the need to behave congruent with the way we wanna identify themselves. We don't identify ourselves as what we were before we were kidnapped and westernized and Caucasianized by the enemy. So, so most black people, we can, we've never learned about the history of us as a people before slavery. Everything we learn during Black History Month or in any class is always from the plantation to the present or the cotton field to the current. Never did we learn about ourselves when we were building the pyramids and we had irrigation systems that were advanced and we were flying and going deep into the water with submarines thousands of years ago. We don't learn about that. So because of that, cotton field to the current, plantation to the present. We're comparing ourselves with burlap, 
working on the, in the field for nothing. So now when you see somebody that can do what they love to do, that's fun, and I'm making millions doing it, you know, we, we start talking about, you know, I started from the bottom. <laughs> now I'm here. Yeah. But the real truth is we started from the top, and now we way down here, and that little step up is not a big enough step. So I'm saying that to say that even though we are in the sport and we're making the money, be, unless we are taught, so teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said a thorough knowledge of self, we will not return to our original self. So to become that proud, powerful, productive, and pious people we once were, we're to have that, 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 that identity of self that makes us say, man, I'm not going to just be up here running up and down this damn court entertaining these crackers. I mean, I'm more important than that. I, I like playing this, but, but this thing here ain't going to last for seven to ten years. What am I going to do after that? You know, matter of fact, I want to own the team. And if they don't let me own the team, you know what? We'll start our own league. And let's do it for self. And you see Ice Cube with the big three. He, he don't play basketball. I don't know if he can shoot a free throw. I don't know how, but I know he got sense. And now he's taking the brothers that don't play in the NBA anymore and they are over there functioning, but, but he's got a league. They're making money. They make fans is coming out to watch it. We could do the same thing in all the fields and we could dominate uh, and control it for ourselves. We just, have to, we just have to make that bold stance. And that comes from that expectation that will come from that identity and that proper identity is going to come from us getting that thorough knowledge of self as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has taught us and his teacher, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, told us. So that, that's where it's at. That's where it's at. And, and I'm going to say this. You a better man making $25,000 a year doing for yourself than you are making $100,000 a year working for your enemy. Because you can't pass on to your children a job, but you can pass on to your children an enterprise or a business. When you are, whenever you are inside of corporate America, we have to come to the grips that I'm given the prime of my life, the best of every day and the best years of my existence to making sure I make my contribution as a black man to uphold white supremacy. So I'm saying that to say it'll be better for the athlete to get $200,000 a year with their own league. They'll be more respected with, among their children and among their people. And they will have a better uh, self-worth than they do making $200 million on a plantation shooting and dribbling and dunking for a bunch of white fans. And Brother Nui, that's why sometimes Looking through that lens of sports being slavery, ever since I heard that from the minister, looking at the landscape, I find myself getting frustrated with these top tier athletes because they're complicit. They yeah. are protectors and maintainers of the system of white supremacy. Yeah. You know, it's like they got their 200 million and they turn around to all the kids across the nation and say, look, I made it. Now these kids are aspiring to be in that position. And like you said, they're not fighting for more. Yeah. And could it be that our own brothers are a part of the problem? And how do we handle that? Well, it always is the case, you know, and that there's not a movie uh, or a war story that you read where an outside enemy was successful without getting an agreement and representation or host or agents operating for them from the inside out. It always takes place. Now, whether these brothers know that that's what they are or not, is another question. But, but I, 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 I like the shift that appears to be taking place at, at the inspiration of LeBron James. See, look, more than an athlete. So he got a line of cloak, more than an athlete. Constantly reminding people, I'm more than an athlete and so are you. So that kind of shifts the mind a little bit. You see him whenever he talks about his accomplishments, he doesn't talk about championship rings, his shoe contract with Nike, 
or how many records he broke in the NBA. He said his greatest accomplishment is opening up schools for his children. So, you know, I would like to see him not in partnership with the public food, st I mean, school system. <laughs> Because the same curriculum, that same Abbasist curriculum that has uh, uh, as its foundation white supremacy is the same curriculum that is being propagated in, in most public schools anyway. So you, you're coming out with a heavy dosage of invalidation as a black child. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad called the public school system the killing fields. Now, most of the children. At 18, they're not dead. They come out of there with the tassel flipped over with a diploma. But what you'll find if you interview the children, go back to when you talk to them when they was five or six and ask them what they wanted to be in life. Everything they had was big, grand, great, something they wanted to do to make a, a maximum, maximum contribution to the rise of their people or for their family. But then you interview them when they graduate from high school and watch how downgraded and modified their aspiration was. Well, what happened? They met spirit killers, dream snatchers, and aspiration assassins inside the killing field. So I would like to see him uh, open up, you know, true schools that are independent, educated with a new curriculum. He has the power to do that. But my point being that there is a little bit of a shift coming and, and you see Kyrie, he letting you know, it, it mean, every money ain't everything. I'm standing. You're not sticking me with nothing. I'm, I'm, I got right over my own body. I don't trust it, so I ain't taking it. Take the games, whatever you want to do. Find me, fine. Our own community chastised him. A lot of people from my community yeah. call yeah. him crazy because, again, he's passing up on the back. Yeah, but, that, but that's what I'm saying. So principles. See, see whenever a person is buried... There's no U-Haul attached to the back of a hearse to show to so they can take with them all the wealth that they acquired into the world. In fact, you don't see on no obituary people bragging about how much money somebody had. Every obituary talks about not their pocket, but the principles that they seen exhibited by this individual, not their cash, but the character. So, so at the end of the day, we're not going to be known by the cash, but by our character. We're not going to be known by our wealth, but we're going to be known by our wisdom. We're, we're not going to be known by the dollar. We're going to be known by how well we serve Allah. That's how we're going to be known. So when the math is all done, when, it, when our chips are all down, that's why Jesus would say, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? Because the soul is more valuable than all the wealth of the world. So at the end of the day, uh, as you have on your shirt, he was punished financially. But why is he known as the greatest? Because he stood on what his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, taught him, and he made it a principle of life. And he said, the Viet Cong ain't never called me no nigga, so why should I go over there and fight for them? I, I, I'm in America. Why would I fight for somebody that's been treating me? like I've been treated in America and go fight somebody that has done nothing for me. So now look, he's known Muhammad Ali, yes. as Muhammad Ali. He's known as quote unquote, the greatest, but that, that wouldn't have happened had he punked out. That wouldn't have happened had he said, I got to get the bag, <laughs> you know? So you can't, you can't listen uh, to the jury in the court of public opinion. Cause you know, there's a, there's a scripture that, that says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. So when something seems right, what makes something seem right? Popular. The majority is saying it. The majority is doing it. So there's many things that you'll see people popularize, but that doesn't mean that it's right. So I think that he's, and we support him. We stand with him. He's a soldier. And, and he'll go down. Uh, like Kaepernick, showing that no matter what, integrity is what I live for. Not my pocket, but my principles. Principles. Uh, brother, there are a few things you spoke about in there. Oh, with, with Kyrie, I was reading something from Malcolm X. He said he was talking about how impactful the media can be. It can have yeah. the innocent looking guilty, 
and the guilty looking innocent. Stephen A. Smith, a personality on ESPN, took a lot of flack for him criticizing uh, Kyrie Irving's stance. You know, you see people on social media calling him an Uncle Tom and stuff. What do you think of that criticism of Stephen A. Smith? And what, what do you think is the responsibility of those black men who have this position, platform, this yeah. platform? Well, it's, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said this. He said, think five times before you speak and you may be right. So that means that anything you want to say, technically, you should run it over five times and see if you can find something in it that should be taken out or see if there's something that needs to be added to it. Do that five times, then say it. I think that uh, for our brother Stephen A. Smith and others that are, are black faces in high places that have these platforms, that they should, they should do uh, their due diligence to investigate the stance and weigh the weight of their words before they, they speak them. And I guarantee you, we'll see. I wanna, I wanna see if he makes that kind of mistake again. I believe that he's, he's learned from it, but it's, it's something that media as a whole, anytime black people got a problem, it, it, it's, it's criminal. But when white people have that same problem, it's clinical. Criminal for us, clinical for them. When black people are in the news for a negative, we are demonized. But when white people are in the news for a negative, they're sanitized. So, so in a case where you've got Stephen A. Smith, Kyrie Irving said boldly, I am not taking the vaccine. I don't trust it. I'm not going to take it. He didn't lie. But on the flip side, now you got Aaron Rodgers. They asked, did you take the vaccine? Yes, I've been immunized. I have immunity. I mean, he's, he's technically, he's not saying he got a vaccine, but by saying, yes, I've been immunized, that yes could mean that you saying you did get a vaccine. And then he started saying that there's people on my team and you know, in the NFL, it's a big topic, you know, I mean, there's some that, you know, they haven't gotten vaccine and we don't look down on them. So you categorizing yourself as one that has been vaccinated, even though you want, weren't. I support Aaron Rodgers' position. Like I support Kyrie Irving's position. Don't let them stick you in the new up-to-date Tuskegee Experiment 2.0. Don't let it happen. I'm with that. But I'm saying that to say, what is it in the mind of us as a people that even when Obama was president, look at the way that he communicated with black people in the aggressiveness, in, in the position, like I feel like I can check you. When, but, but whenever he talks to white people, he talks a whole different language. He's diplomatic, cordial, respectful. How was Stephen A. Smith whenever Dan Rogers came up about? See, cordial, respect. So it's bigger than a black face in a high place that has a platform to say what they want to say. What is the root of it? The root of it is, unfortunately, most of our people, no matter what position they have or money they have, they still are the victims of the damnable disease of self-hatred. So you can talk to Kyrie in a sharp, harsh, disrespectful tone, but diplomatic, kind, and very careful with your word when you talk about Aaron Rodgers. Shame. Now, Brother Nui, can, can one say that Stephen A. and people in that position are preparing the brothers to go out there and fight the war and prepare them because it is different for a black man out there? Similar to with your kid, you, you scold them, hey, when you go out there, you deal with those police, make sure you're on, on point. Well, it's a difference between being on point and being in, in accord with the code of righteous principles and teaching your children to be a coward. See, I, I never told my children, not my, my son, I told him that it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees that a coward dies a thousand deaths, but a soldier dies 
but once. And I don't care who's talking to you. A blue uniform, a badge and a gun does not give them the authority to violate your rights as a man. So you 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 put yourself and keep yourself in accord with the morals and what's right. But if it goes sideways, you stand on yours. Don't capitulate, compromise, buck dance, bootlick or 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 uh, put yourself into a cowardly position so that you can survive. See, that's slave culture. Once they this is this is the way they did it, according to the history of the writings of Willie Lynch, who was a slave maker from the West Indies hired by the American slave ma makers to teach them how to get the best productivity out of their slaves. Listen to one of the things he said, do. He said, take the pregnant nigger female and make her watch while we tie her man to four sapling trees and cut the ropes at all at one time and split him open. Bury him under the ground with his head above ground while he's alive and pour molasses on him and let insects eat him. Make her watch it. Take 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 that woman and let let her see us beat him to death or hang him or cut off all of his parts. He said, because it puts them, this is Willie Lynch, it puts the black mother into what's called a frozen psychological state where they'll be so fearful of their sons being alive that they would train them to be subservient and cowardly when it comes to dealing with the slave master. So I'm saying that to say, if we're going to teach our young people or if you're in a position of power, if you're going to teach black people to conduct themselves in a certain way, teach it because it's the proper way, it's the civilized way, it's the moral and the ethical way, but don't teach it so that you will be non-offensive to white people. Teach it because it's the right way to conduct yourself. And, you know, we have a code that we're never the aggressor. But if we are aggressed upon, we fight with those who fight with us. So we're, we're peaceful. But if you are the aggressor, then we have the right and responsibility to respond accordingly. So that's the way that those with those platforms should be doing. They shouldn't be trying to make uh, black men more punctified and, and be able to, to be non-offensive and non-threatening whenever they are around white people. That's all you see all the time. Every time you, I'm talking about in 2021, you go around black people when white people are present. They allow when they're around, soon, be quiet, head down, respectful. And, I, and, and at the gym, I watch black people agree with what white people are saying that they don't even agree with. So we, we don't want to foster that old Willie Lynch slave breaking system by telling black people, look, you got to go, you got to do it twice as hard, you got to run twice as fast, you got to bite your tongue, you can't say, you, oh yeah, I'm a grown man. I'm gonna be a man. And whatever the consequences come with it, even if it may mean death, then all praise is due to Allah. <laughs> we go out on our feet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> You brought up Ice Cube's Big Three League. I was reading an article a few years back, and the minister's grandson, Mustafa Farrakhan, yeah. was, was set to uh, participate in the league. Mustafa Farrakhan played big time college basketball, yeah. ACC, Virginia Cavaliers, a uh, four year player there. He went on to the G League and stint overseas, but he never made it to the NBA. In one of the, the minister's speeches, he insinuated that. Perhaps the name Farrakhan mm -hmm. might have uh, been an issue for that young man in trying to break through in the league. How, how likely is that? Is it sports the last bastion of meritocracy where it's merit-based, your skills, it's not about race, color, Jew, Gentile, religion? On paper. But that name Farrakhan, it, it produces love and admiration in black people's hearts but it produces hatred in those 
uh, Caucasians that are in power because they have been engaged in for over 35 years a conspiracy of silence. What does that mean? A conspiracy of silence means that they try to ignore and act like what the minister's saying and doing is not happening. So they found, and it's written even in the COINTELPRO with J. Edgar Hoover's counterintelligence program, they said then that dealing with Elijah Muhammad and the nation, he said, don't give them any coverage in the media, printed, oral, or visual. He said, because even negative press generates curiosity among a certain class of black people, and they may be curious, listen, and join. So, so you're talking J. Edgar Hoover, who started without saying it, a conspiracy of silence. Now they've continued that up until this day. So now here you are. I mean, how do you, the, the, the newscaster got to say, Farrakhan for three. Farrakhan, 12 assists, Farrakhan at the free throw line. They didn't want to be able to say that. That doesn't support the conspiracy of silence. So Brother Mustafa had skills that were comparable with some of the best point guards that are operating in the NBA right now. And it is because of that name and them having to see that name on the back of a jersey and say it when he performed, they uh, blackballed him or whiteballed him in this case to keep him out. That is, you know, that is our belief. And, and um, he's fine. He's doing fine. I spoke to him uh, two days ago, uh, just in a brief statement. And he's he's going to be all right. I think sometimes people believe these leagues are these big international global organizations, but it really just comes down to 30 owners and 32 owners when right. about NFL, NBA that are making these decisions. That leaves all of these legions of young men that's hope vying for these positions kind of vulnerable to those owners' discretion. Well, and that's, that's the unfortunate reality. Um, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan once, he used the term to describe the record executives, the label owners, the team owners. He used the term, he called them gatekeepers. I said, man, a gatekeeper. So here, if I'm at the gate, the gate is connected to the front of the yard. Then the yard is connected to the house. Then you got to go through the door to get into the house to enjoy what you came to enjoy, participate where you came to participate. So when you have these few select gatekeepers, how many media outlets? There's six major media owners that own all music, television, and printed media, six. So guess what they do? They stand at the, the gate and they say, okay, let me see, this is uh, 150 artists that have the ability to go big. But let me interview each one of you to see which one of you will be the most non-threatening to white supremacy and that I can get to push my agenda and you will not be someone that will inspire your people to do anything great. How dead are you? You got skill, but how dead are you? And then they look at the 150 and say, you know what? This is going to be the one we're going to promote because black people have so much talent. You know, there used to be a saying uh, on the plantation, nigga sing, nigga dance, nigga jump, nigga die. And if you look at it, these are the four areas of human expression that black people are allowed to manifest greatness in with the least amount of hindrance and suppression. Sing for me. Dance for me. Or if you're not, jump. What's jump? Sports. So entertainment, sports. And if you're not singing, dancing, entertaining, dead. So dealing death is selling dope. Or killing each other is another form of death. We're allowed to manifest greatness in death. 
we're allowed to manifest greatness in sport and we're allowed to manifest it in entertainment. So what happens to us as we are growing up? Interview anybody. Everybody wants to be, I, what do you want to be? I want to be a rapper. What do you want to be? I want to be in the NBA. What do you want to be? I want to be in the NFL. What do you want to be? I want to be uh, a singer. Everybody, everybody's thinking, sing, dance, jump, die. That's, what every, that's the goal because these are the areas where we can manifest ourselves with the minimum amount of hindrance and suppression. So what do they do? They take all of the talent, all of the skill, all of the gifts that black people have, and we, they channel it in these areas. And then they have a pool of people that are proficient in basketball, football, rapping, singing. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And then they can pick and choose. All right, which one do I think will be the one that will be most consistent at promoting my agenda, non-threatening to the power structure of white supremacy. They, yeah, they got the same, all of them got skills, but which one is gonna be the safe Negro that I can put out there to make me some money and he won't upset the balance of white superpower? That's the one. And these leagues are now identifying these young men at younger and younger ages, 12, 13, the social media following is through the roof. They, they hand picking them, sending them to different tournaments. And these young men are conscious of this. I, I got to stay in line so I don't upset that system. I don't know if they know it's the system of white supremacy, right. but they know they need to, to be in line. What does that mean for black people if our strongest young men are under the control of that system. What's that mean for our people? You know, there, there's a verse that says this in Revelations. By the rivers of Babylon we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps on the willow tree. And those that had carried us away and made us captive required of us a song or mirth. Comedian, make me laugh. Make, make a song for me. And... And this is the condition that we're in. So what is happening, as I said about a LeBron or an Ezekiel Elliott, they are manifesting greatness on the football field or the basketball court, but their purpose for living is greater than basketball or football. If they had discovered, you know what? At five years old, I think, I know I'm supposed to be an engineer and put that same work ethic into engineering, then there would be a LeBron James of, of, of engineering. So what has to happen with us, we have to counter the conspiracy to, to tunnel all of our talent into sports and entertainment and begin shifting that talent into areas that are going to be good for us to build a nation with. We need architects, we need engineers, chemists, doctors. Well, you know we need uh, doctors with the way the world is right now. We need, we need scientists uh, that started at a very young age putting that same discipline in. So I, I'm saying to us uh, as, as parents, at the end of the day, they're going to continue to make this the area that they want to channel our children into. Nigga sing, dance, jump, or die. But we have to, to stop them at our gate and be gatekeepers and say, no, you know what? I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start rewarding academics more than I reward athletics. Because right now in the black community, we do pizza parties. We do celebrations. Every time somebody, you know, go to the little, little league or, or, or they didn't play this game and they didn't won the championship at 10 and 7 and whatever. We, but we don't do the same when it comes to academics. And I'm not saying just grades in school, but we have to start giving our children homework. And, and homework has to have a new definition. It can't be the going over and the regurgitation of what they gave you in the public school system that's the killing field. It has to be, I'm giving assignments to you based off of the life skills and the knowledge of self I know you're gonna need to be a proud black man or black woman whenever you grow old. So I want you to have this. So study this and let's reward that. I used to do a little something with my children uh, and I would pay them for studying different books 
Now, they went to our school all the way till they were going to high school. But after they got into high school, I kept it up. And, you know, sometimes they was my youngest daughter one time. She almost broke me. <laughs> I said, oh, study, huh? I had told her, uh, I think it was $100 a book, just summertime. We and I told her, you got to study it, take notes and I'm going to quiz you. She was knocking books down in days. I said, oh, my God. I think I owed her in a couple of months. I think I owed her like either eight or twelve hundred dollars. I wanted to renegotiate my contract, but, wait, <laughs> but, but, but my point is, guess what she told me at the end? She told me, Daddy, you don't have to give me no money. I got everything that I needed. So my, my, my point is, how do we uh, circumvent or counter the conspiracy to destroy black boys and black girls, as Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu worded it? We have to begin to tell our children, you're born to be more than a ball runner, a ball catcher, or you're born to do more than just perform on a stage. You got a better calling on your life than that. You can do that as a hobby for fun. And if you're that good at it and it can help you get where you're trying to go and you can earn a lot of money from it, do it. But at the same time, remember your purpose. Your purpose is more important than performing uh, on a court or a stage. And I think that if we did that, but William, we would be able to redirect the gift, skills, and talents that our children have naturally in them toward nation building skills instead of holding white supremacy. That's interesting that you bring that up because I've been trying to be more conscious of that, um, celebrating not just the ball player in the community. Because you'll see a young person with social media, and over the last three years, they'll only post like four pictures, and all four of those pictures are their basketball pictures. Wow. Because any other aspect of their life, they're not going to be celebrated. Wow. So mm. that's uh, I've definitely been more conscious of that and try to some of the coaches in the community make sure we celebrate everybody, the scientists, the athlete, everybody just the same. Hey, uh, can, let me can I just say this too, bro? Wait before we move to another one. You know, black people, white people play sports too. Yes, they play basketball, they play football, they play they play uh, soccer, they play all the stuff that we play as children. The difference between white people and black people is white people, black people play a sport to become a professional at it. White parents put their children in the sports to extract the principles from it. So the principles that you will learn playing any sport, teamwork, discipline, sacrifice, working through fatigue, you have, you have to, to compromise personal time and creature comforts or what you want to do to do what you need to do. All of those traits are transferable traits that you can take with you in any field. I remember Magic Johnson uh, some years ago was, it's right when they started the D-League, but he was asked to come and speak to the new class of NBA players, you know, for the lack of a better word, the rookies. They hadn't got all the way in yet, but they was getting ready to start the, 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 the season. And listen to what he told them. He said, I want to show these young brothers how to take the brain they built in basketball and use it for business. I said, boy, if that if that if that happens now, I haven't heard anything about him speaking to them again. I wonder why. See, 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 white people put their children in the sports to extract the principles from it. Black people put our children in sports to become a professional at it. So when black people don't become NBA, NFL, we end up being out, broken spirit, on drugs, drinking all the time. Our whole life is over. But white people, they went to sports, played too. Well, guess what? They took teamwork, discipline, sacrifice, focus, working through fatigue, and they use it in their law firm, in their insurance business. They use it in their corporation, in their restaurant chain. That's because they extracted the principles from it, not trying to become a professional at it. We've got to take a page from that, from that and start doing that more with our children and make sure that everybody knows that if you don't make it to the NBA or the NFL, that is not your life. You still can take those traits and make them transferable and use that brain you built in basketball for business and be just as successful. 
Brother Nuri, how do you feel when you see some of these owners get caught up in some trouble? You know, uh, most recently, Robert Sarver of the Phoenix Suns, they say he a misogynistic and racist environment. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, it was Jerry Richardson of the Carolina Panthers. We know about Donald Sterling. How do you feel when you see these stories come out in the news? All of it becomes just a case to do what the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us to do. And he said, do for self or suffer the consequences. So it, it should uh, spark in us a greater spirit of, of independence, where we want to be able to create for ourselves. But you know, like I know, that those Caucasians that are in power and have wealth, they operate uh, generally in a whole different kind of world that is a godless environment. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teacher, Master Father Muhammad, asked him a question and that we repeat it now. It says, why doesn't the devil allow us into, in, paraphrase, into his social affairs? And the answer was for fear that we will learn how filthy that they are in all their ways and run them from among us. So for many years, Caucasian people in power have been engaged in some of the craziest freakishness that has ever existed. And they never allowed us in because at that time, we were still operating at least from some degree of our genetic memory where we had a different moral compass than most of them had. So Caucasians then let us in to their world. That was then. Now, of course, they inviting you into the world. Where, so, so when you see these entertainers, black entertainers, they get caught for doing all kinds of scandals. But if you can interview, you know what they would say? Well, white people been, I learned this from, from, from Doug and, and Biff and Muffy and them. They taught me how to do this. They've been doing this for years. Why come ain't nobody messing with them? That's, that's how they've been operating. So to me, it's no shock. We know that they're filthy in all, all their ways. Our problem as a people, we've got to get our moral compass back where even if we don't have the strength to run them, from among us, hell, we got the strength to run from among them. And I think that that should be uh, a testimony. Not to say, oh, that's how they get down when you get to the top, let me do it. No, oh, that's how they getting down at the top. I ain't fooling with them. I'm gonna do it different. I'm gonna have money, but I'm gonna have me some morals. I'm gonna be rich and right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have me some wealth, but I'm gonna have me some wisdom. I'm gonna get my cheddar, my chips, but I'm also going to keep my character. I'm going to get the bag, yes. but I'm also going to keep my belief in the one true God and, and my people. And if we did that, I think we could shake that. We'd be all right. Yeah, we'd be okay. Brother Nuri, do for self. I always think about that in the off season when I hear these conversations about we need more black coaches. To yeah. me, it sounds like, like begging. Yeah. But Brother Nuri, do for self, like start our own league. Like, how plausible is that? To some people, that's, that's impossible. No way, not in this lifetime, not in the next lifetime, not in the lifetime after that. Well, we, we just brought Ice Cube to the witness stand and he, he's verifying that it's not as impossible as we thought it was. So it, it's, it's very uh, possible. The people you know from being involved in sports yourself and watching it all these years, there's no black child that's running around chanting the name of the owners of these teams. Absolutely. We don't even know the names of the owners, general managers. Most of us don't even know the names of the coaches. We're, we, we, are, we have an affinity for the athlete. So the athlete, really, how can I say this? Every nation on earth has a natural resource that puts them into a position of power. Saudi Arabia, Oil, you know, South Africa may have <clears throat> rubber, you know, Guyana may have bauxite. It puts you in the power. Some people grow bananas on, it puts them in the power. Guess what our oil is? Talent. So why shouldn't we use the talent for self and do it in, in a way? So it, it's, it's possible, feasible, and 
and it can work. Before they let us in, we had it. There was a Negro baseball league. Soon as they let us in, we lost it. Integration was really disintegration of everything independent and black. Because soon as we had a chance to eat in their restaurants, sleep in their hotels, ride in their cars, and go to their dry cleaners, and, and play on their field, in their sport, in their arena, all of ours went to hell. Well, we could do it back then, because we had to. Well, we should have enough wisdom, insight, and wherewithal now to do it now, because we want to. So it, it, it definitely is uh, feasible, plausible, uh, and, and it can be done. A brother told me, um, he was, I don't know, I'll see if I can say this, but I, I don't want it to be known who I'm talking about. There's a brother highly placed in politics that received a high position in uh, government. And I congratulated him and listened to his words. He said, yeah, brother, I ain't something I really you know, really was into politics like that. But if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I said, uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I said, have you ever thought about us having our own restaurant with our own kitchen? <laughs> Where we had our own table and our own menu. Yes, sir. Is anything wrong with that? He said, no, but of course, feasible, plausible. So you, we, we just, man, we, we spend too much time trying to repair the system and not enough time replacing it. God doesn't want us to integrate in and get a bigger piece of this nasty American pie. He wants us to grow our own wheat, our own navy beans, and get our own kitchen and let's make our own bean pie. And, and have our own pie. Well, we don't have to get a little bigger piece of the American pie. How long are we going to be on a begging campaign? The minister highlighted something. He said, he said in the 40s, they were, were protesting and they were demanding jobs and justice. He said, I looked at the march in 63 and they were outside again. What do they want? Jobs and justice. He said, then the 20-year anniversary came around in 1983. I think the minister spoke at it. He said, they were out there saying, what do we want? Jobs and justice. Here we are in the modern time. Next time they have another one, guess what they're going to be asking for? Jobs. And at what point do we come to the conclusion that I've been holding my hands out here this long asking you to embrace me as your brother. Treat me right. Give me a fair shake. And they still haven't extended their arms to you. Damn, when do your arms get tired? When, how long do you stay on the porch after knocking on the door and, no, and you know they're in there and they don't come to open the door? If they're not coming to the door and if they're not willing to embrace us like we're trying to embrace them, why don't we put our arms down? Hell, they're going to get tired anyway. They're going to get tired either from begging or they're going to get tired from building. At least if they get tired from building, we have something. But if we keep on holding them out and letting them get tired from begging, we'll stand there with nothing. So that's the same philosophy for the league, for independence. It's universal. We have to begin to do as the most honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us to do for self. Or guess what? We're going to continue to suffer these consequences. So we got to graduate from, from begging to building and go from having a colony into a community. And if we do that, then uh, we'll be able to provide a future for our people that is not hinged upon uh, white people knocking a few crumbs off their table, hoping that us, Lazarus, lazy, or us is going to be able to get something to eat. I mean, I don't think nobody can live off no crumbs that fall no, sir. from no table. And I know for sure you can't take care of your children with them. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Uh, Brother Nuri, I told you I've been uh, paying attention to the nation since your appearance on The Breakfast Club, listening yeah. to the lecture, reading the books. One of the books I read, Message to the Black Man, 
Oh, oh man, that's the one. That's the one. Let's hit the applause, but somebody, <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Brother Nuri, can you please explain to those who may not have read it or who are unaware of the book, how would you describe Message to the Black Man by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? I would describe Message to the Black Man as the key to unlock all of the wisdom that you will read from any book, including Bible and Holy Quran, and even deeper than that, the key that you can use to unlock the power inside of your own self. That, that book, Message to the Black Man, uh, is not just a book that T.I. said that Nipsey Hussle, whenever he was talking to Nipsey Hussle, who was, uh, he read a lot. He said whenever he met with Nipsey Hussle, he gave him one book. It was Message to the Black Man. And that book is, I would say, it is the greatest shovel of resurrection that has been put in paper form that has ever existed among black people. And one of the keys to it is that in the back of Message to the Black Man, there's two sections, one called A Guide to Understanding the Bible and another is called The Guide to Understanding the Holy Quran. And you can look in it, you can see a subject, then you can see a page number, read what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said about that verse, and then, and then what ends up happening to you as you began to learn the breakdown that God gave to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad on the parables and the metaphors and the similes that are found in Scripture. Guess what happens to you? Now you start learning those metaphors and, know, and what these different symbols represent in Scripture. Next thing you know, you start picking up the book based off a program in your mind with his guide to understand it. And now you begin to decode the Scripture and the real power of wisdom, the real treasure, the value of things is not in reading what you see is going in to what you see. You can't get gold on top of the earth. You got to dig for it. Diamonds are not laying around. You've got to go deep into the earth. You can't get a pearl floating. Pearls don't float. They're in the oyster that's at the bottom of the sea. You got to go deep into. And the same way that God made it in his physical world that you got to go into the earth to get the real valuable things, to get the treasures, you also have to go into Bible, into the Holy Quran to be able to get the treasures and the value that's found in the scripture. The teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad in general and message to the black men in specific allows you to go deep sea diving for that pearl, allows you to go down into the earth and mine out the power found in the Bible, the Quran, and deeper than that even in yourself. So that's what I would, I would say uh, about Message to the Black Man. That is the book that I read that within the first few chapters, I said, this is how I've been believing all of my life. I just didn't know how to say it like this. My brother, Nuri, what about those individuals that may be hesitant to, to read it because they're not a Muslim? They're right. not a Christian. They, they don't really consider themselves religious. Is their message really for every black man? Well, that it's for all black men and black women. It's for us as a people. And really, um, there's even a book out called Message to the White Man and White Woman. And this is a book written by Caucasians who have taken Message to the Black Man and written it in a way that it appeals to white, white people. Notice that I didn't mention like you have on your shirt, Muhammad Ali. That picture, him holding that Muhammad Speaks newspaper, that's one of the most popular images. But the other image that's very popular of Muhammad Ali is him holding up that mess to the black man. I didn't mention the Muslims. I said Nipsey Hussle gave mess to the black man to T.I. Now, by our definition, T.I. and Nipsey Hussle are Muslims because we believe that all of our people are Muslims by nature, as Muslim just means righteous person or one that submits their will to do the will of God. By nature, we're born to do that as original people. So we consider everybody a member of the nation. They just haven't reclaimed their spot. So those that are not, you know, uh, registered or so-called Muslims, you got to get the message to the black man. It is that book that will unlock the wisdom that you read in any other book. It gives you 
the key essential knowledges. One, knowledge of God, knowledge of self, knowledge of your enemy, and a knowledge of the time and what must be done. Check it out. Read it. And if you dive into it, you'll see. It does something to your mind, to your spirit. I, Brother William, when I, before I joined the nation, I, I had all D's and F's in school. And I came in the nation, I, got, I joined and got registered when I was 17. My senior year in high school, I had a 4.0 GPA. And I only went to school on Thursdays and Fridays. I'm not recommending that to any other young people <laughs> and that's watching this, because you right. will, you will, I wasn't supposed to graduate uh, either. And uh, that's a, a whole long story. But they let me graduate because I had straight A's. Argument was if you're gonna let someone with all D's graduate because they came to school every day. I only came to school Thursdays and Fridays. I got straight A's. Which one learned the best? I had to say I did. But at that time, the principal of my high school was a black woman, uh, took me to a white man that was her assistant who was over the truancy for the school. And he could, she said he could possibly make a way for you to graduate, even though you've missed more days of school than you've been here. And uh, when I walked into the room, she asked, so tell me this, is the white, is the white man the devil? And I said, yes, ma'am, the white man is the devil. And he told me, get out of my office. I didn't ask to come in your office. She brought me in here uh, to do that. And, you know, I, I told her I had two and a half weeks left of school. And I told her, I said, you are an Aunt Jane. And if you don't know what that is, go read about it. You and Aunt Jane. I told her, I don't, I don't need your school or no piece of paper from the school to be what I want to be in life. So I don't, I don't really care about graduating, but that was wrong. And lo and behold, I end up seeing her husband, who was a principal of another school I went to, and he told me to go see her. She wants to work it out. They let me graduate. But my point is that D's and F's to straight A's was a product of mess to the black man and two tapes that I had by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And what, what happened was, is that I believed that I am the, I'm the original man. I'm the Asiatic black man. I'm the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth. I'm God of the universe. And the color man is the Caucasian white man or Yakub's grafted devil, the skunk of the planet Earth. They came from me. I'm, the, I'm, I'm they daddy. So what can my children put in front of me that I can't master? So when I went back to school, I didn't say it out loud, but I was always thinking, you can't put no test, no paper, no assignment. Ain't nothing you can put in front of me as my child that I can't get. I get an A on it. I'm doing this. But that kind of true self-worth was a product of mess to the black man. So anybody that wants to activate that power, that personal power within, where you're operating with true self-worth, you gotta get that message to the black man. Message to the black man. And you brought up Muhammad Ali, one of the most famous and celebrated athletes in history, who was right. once a member of the Nation of Islam. And with message to the black man specifically, and I was reading about Ali, and this, this blew my mind. When he had his court case against the US government, because mm -hmm. he did not want to be drafted in the army or the military for Vietnam, the judge, Supreme Court Justice John Harlan Come on. used message to the black men in his decision. He used it to confirm that Ali was indeed a Muslim and gave him conscientious objective status. Right. So America likes to act as if this book doesn't exist at times. Yeah. But the highest court in the land is well aware of message to the black men. Brother Nuri, I don't even have a question. That just blew <laughs> my mind. The Supreme Court. Yeah knows about this book and this man. But you going but William, I'm gonna tell you this and to those in the viewing audience, do you, you know that almost every president of the United States of America were Masons. And a Mason, M-A-S-O-N, it stands for Muslim son. They're sons of Muslims. George Washington was a Mason. And these are Caucasian people, the Shriners, they study Islam in secret. 
So if you ever go to any of, just look at the names of the Masonic lodges, Mecca Lodge, Medina Lodge, that's in Saudi Arabia. And go look at what they wear whenever they are fully dressed. They wear a fez like the one you see in the Ali Blaj Muhammad, suit and a bow tie. They talk about crossing the burning stand. Here, there is what they call the, they call it the old national uh, uh, theater now, but it really was the Marat Theater owned by the Masons and Shriners. You go on that floor where you buy tickets and they have in granite the star and crescent like this, it's facing down. They have a sword over top of it and that represents, so teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that they're saying that they know that they must keep their study of Islam a secret. And if they ever expose that they are studying it, their head will be taken off by the sword. But look on the floor and on the floor, there's a five point star. In the middle of the five point star is a black man's face. And around the star on each point, there's a letter. A-L-L-A-H. Allah. So what, what are they saying? I know the black man is God. I know who the tr true and living God is. So you remember um, Keith Ellison, whenever he was first becoming a congressman in Minneapolis, yes. he said that I wanted to take my oath of office with my hand on the Holy Quran because I'm a Muslim. And everybody, you know, they went crazy saying, this is a Judeo-Christian society. <laughs> and then Keith Ellison said, well, the Quran that I want to use is Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Founding father, Thomas Jefferson. They went, looked at it, they seen Thomas Jefferson's handwriting in it, and they can tell he had, this was his Quran, he was reading this. What was Thomas Jefferson doing with the Holy Quran? They're studying Islam in secret because they know that the power that Islam can give you is there. They just want to keep it to themselves. So early in the early days, the minister said when he was growing up that whenever he went to the library and asked could he see a Quran, they had it in what was called the rare book section. You had to go in, show ID, sign for it, and you could not leave the library with it. You had to stay right there and read the Holy Quran. So they, they've been studying they Islam in secret. They know. They put it like this. How could Pharaoh say, let's kill all the firstborn boy babies? Moses wasn't even born yet. They knew what they were doing to bring birth, both to, birth to a Moses. So they knew that he was coming before Moses even, his mother even knew. Jesus, King Herod said, let's kill all the boy babies two years old and under. Why? Because they know that Jesus is coming. How do you know? You know what you're doing and you know what you're studying. The rulers of this world. Why would J. Edgar Hoover say that we must prevent the rise of a black Messiah? Unless he knew what they were doing and he knew what was written to justify the coming of this Messiah that would be black. And he made his candidates that he put in there. He had Stokely Carmichael, Carmichael Kwame Ture, he had Martin Luther King, he had Malcolm X, and he had the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Four people. Yes. Three of them either were the Honorable Elijah Muhammad or his students. Stokely Carmichael said that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was his leader and his teacher. Of course, you know Malcolm X seen the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as his leader and teacher. Yes. Only one was Dr. King in the category. They knew black Messiah was going to come. How could you have four people and either one's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad or two people that's connected to him and not recognize who that man is? They knew, they knew. then and they know now. <laughs> Our problem is, is that the enemy always knows the man of God, even sometime before the people of God. So we've got to catch up uh, with it. They've been getting power from Islam. We need to get it for ourselves. The only thing about them, they've been keeping it secret and using their power for wrong. We've got to make it public and use the power that we can get from Islam for good. Brother Nuri, two things on Muhammad Ali that, again, shocked me when I was 
reading about him, if, if you could just respond to this. One, the world likes to hoist Muhammad Ali up as a civil rights advocate, but his fight was for his religion, Islam. Like that was really his crusade. He was taking Islam around the globe. And number two, a message to the black man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, a good name is as good as gold. Right, and right, he, he right. He talked about taking Cassius Clay and giving him the name Muhammad Ali and how that made him the world's champion. Right. Africa and Asia embraced him in a way right. that they wouldn't have any other way because Cassius Clay was just the white man's name. When they see you with that name, when you just exult in the white man's world. But when I put you in your original name, yes. you became the world's champion. Right. Again, things that just blew Well, up. that and, and what you're saying, bro, well, that's, that's an actual fact. Uh, and we've seen it with the rumble in the jungle. Look at the way they responded to George Foreman getting off that plane with his German shepherd. You come off the plane with a German shepherd wearing a white man's name. So look at the people in, in, in Africa. Ali, kumbaya, George Foreman. Ali, kumbaya. They're talking about killing. They're talking about don't just beat him, kill him. I don't mean, I don't think they meant really killing. Right. But my point is, is that Islam has been for many centuries the number one religion on the planet. Over 1,700,000,000 people in the world are Muslims. So the name Muhammad and the name Ali carries weight with the world. And all the darker nations of the world have an affinity for Muhammad the prophet, peace be upon him, and Ali, his companion, his, his cousin, they have a, a, an affinity for that. So here's a Muhammad and a Ali, black man from America, champion of the world. And look at how he, 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 he comes in the ring, he would pray before his fight, you know? And, and after the ring, all praises due to Allah for the honor of Elijah Muhammad. He was bold, representing. So the, the, the revisionists uh, that like to revise our history, they, they, always, they always give an authorized King James Version of everybody that ever came up for, from among us. And, and they, what they do is they, they, they know that I got control of, as you said earlier, media. I got control of the, the, the system of information distribution. So let me find a way to make you fall in love with the parts of a man that I'm going to make you think existed or that maybe did exist. And I'm going to leave out the things that was was offensive to me or was threatening to my power structure. So they even recently they just found uh, in The New York Times, they reported that the two brothers that were supposed to be guilty of assassination of Malcolm X were exonerated as innocent after all these years. That's now you come up with that. But but you read it. They call uh, Malcolm X a civil rights leader. Muhammad Ali, civil rights leader. The Nation of Islam, under the leadership of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and now under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, we're not civil rights leaders. We're not we're not trying to to go along to get along and, and, and fit in and get a bigger piece. We're trying to establish something for ourselves. So that's, that's the revisionist history. That's the authorized King James Version. You know, they take all of our, our great ones and, and, and they water them down. You know, in, in the street terms, they put some cut on them. <laughs> they step on them. They go get the isotol and baking soda. And B12, and, and, they, and they come in and fatten it up and act like it got this, just like this from North. You know, you know what I'm saying. So that's, that's how they've always done, uh, so that they can pull out and give you an image of a safe version of whom they deem to be a threatening man so that you'll never get the real them and get the power uh, from them. So now they, they bought Muhammad Ali's name. White people own Muhammad Ali's name. Yes, no one with the family. The family, the family doesn't own his name. Before he, I think before he passed, he sold his name, Muhammad Ali, for a certain amount of millions of dollars. So now what does that mean, though? That that means that they control the distribution of his image 
how he'll be recognized and made known to the world. See, it's, it's, it's a form of colonization. And they can do that uh, by doing that. Now they, they have ownership and they can put out what they want to put out or put out nothing at all. So that's, you know, we've seen them when they did it with cross colors. We've seen when they got involved in FUBU. Everything they get a hold of, it all of a sudden go, 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 goes away yes. or becomes a different version of what it was. They did that with clothes. They did it with media, with BET. They do it, unfortunately, with our leaders. Yeah. Brother Noe, they like to point out the fact that Muhammad Ali moved on from the nation of Islam. Uh, why did he do so? Well, I, I can't uh, say that what he did, but I know that I have been present um, whenever Muhammad Ali was not in his uh, strength strength mm -hmm. in his later years of life with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and um, Muhammad Ali, he expressed a great love for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the nation. He wasn't able to communicate right. uh, like he, he once once was but i can say that um, from the language that i heard him using about what he seen about the honorable elijah muhammad and and the nation i think that he has still deep deep love and affinity for the way of the most honorable elijah muhammad and the way of the nation that took him from being a cassius clay and turned him shaped and molded him into being a Muhammad Ali. So I, I don't subscribe to the, um, what happens to a person in the middle of their life. But toward the end, I know that it seemed like from my vantage point, deep love, deep respect, deep honor, love the minister, yes. love the nation, love the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and knows that his uh, making into a man and a Muslim is directly connected to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, so everything I've read is he shows great reverence. You say, you know, I was just a prize fighter. You know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad helped me uh, become the world's champion and helped me find my voice. And when I, when I hear people compare LeBron to Muhammad Ali, you know, now that I've done a lot more reading on Ali, the things that he endured, again, going against the U.S. government, uh, carrying a religion that was not very popular. Mm -hmm. like, he was willing to risk it all. Right. And when I think of the comparison between him and LeBron, to me now, it's comical. Like, right. LeBron ain't enduring any of that stuff. Well, it, I mean, I, I, I think hopefully those that are putting that into the atmosphere would make, see, you start, when you start seeing signs of strength, mm -hmm. then people that have great hope, they start saying, man, in their mind, shoot, might be next Muhammad Ali. Right. But to make that kind of a bold, bold stance would be, would be something that would shake the world up as he shook the world up. And we, we only hope that, that, that there's gonna be somebody that has that kind of uh, platform and is at that height in, in that world that will be able to declare like he declared boldly for his God and his people, uh, like he did. So we, we, are, we are thankful to the work of any worker, all that they did. And, and even in um, his death, he's still making a contribution to the forward and onward and upward movement of our people toward the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in Islam because of the way that he represented and the way he carried himself as, as a Muslim under this teaching. So we, we, uh, we would like to see, I'd like to see LeBron, of course, suited and booted, you know, standing bold like that, that'd be great. Uh, but, you know, Muhammad Ali was a one of a kind. Indeed. And we, uh, we are thankful to Allah for his service and his sacrifice. Uh, that he made in making a contribution to the strengthening of this nation, uh, even now as, as he's gone. 
Mm-hmm. Brother Nuri, going back to Mr. Black Man, uh, uh, a good name is as good as gold. Yeah. You know, it really had me thinking, and I want to make sure I ask you this. How do you feel, you know, if a name is so important, how do you feel when you see our athletes, specifically our young athletes on their social media specifically, calling themselves beasts, dogs, yeah. animal, killer, demon? I mean, terms that we use in athletics. Right. How do you feel? What impact does that have on them, how they receive the community? Well, just as you said, see, the, the most honored Elijah Muhammad, when he was talking about naming Muhammad Ali, and, and in the message of black man, when he deals with the breakdown of getting a holy and righteous name of, of our own, he gives an example of Lu Chen and different names that once you hear them, you automatically think about that, that people that they came from. But when you hear black people give their names, you know, Johnson, Culpepper, Underbrook, Woods, Winfrey, what does that mean? Who does that connect you to? It does connect you to your original people that you came from. It connects you to a plantation that was owned by a slave master. So when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, quoting Isaiah, a good name is better than gold. Well, gold in the ancient times when Isaiah was talking was the medium of exchange. So when you have gold, you're exchanging it for something that you deem or that you want to be more valuable than itself. So whenever you have a good name, you can put it to exchange uh, in the universe to be able to get from the universe something that you want, something that you desire. But if I give my baby a name that has no meaning to it, what do they have to look up to? What can they put it to an exchange? So my children, and the children of the Muslims. We don't give them names that don't have meaning. We give them names that mean something that came from God. So what happens? All their life, you know, they're hearing somebody say, Hanifa, Hanifa, Hanifa. And she's calling herself, what's your name? Hanifa, when she write, Hanifa means one who rejects falsehood and follows the truth. See how that good name is better than gold? Because now every time you write it, every time you say it, every time somebody calls you by, you don't just hear your name. You know that it means that I'm that I'm one that rejects falsehood and follows the truth. What would that do for your life if you follow that principle that your name has attached to it? So that's that's the math. We when we join the nation, we get what's called an X. X in mathematics represents the unknown. Why? Because we don't know what our original name was. And it's easier to literally find out the exact tree that was used to make the lumber that was built this rostrum than it is to find out what our original name once was. So we get an X that represents the unknown. But an X also uh, is given because he was Cassius X first. So the X, guess what it does? If you're taking a test and you get something wrong, they put an X on the left side of the wrong answer. What is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad telling us? You got it wrong calling yourself Johnson. You got it wrong calling yourself Jackson. In fact, Jackson, Johnson, Samson, Thompson, that's John's son. That's Sam's son. That's Tom's son. You're not Tom or John. That's English Caucasian name. You're the original. So we get an X and it crosses out the slave name. And then as time goes on uh, and you work inside the nation, then at a certain point, the minister sees your work, hears about your good work and gives you a holy name of your own. So he was blessed with that. Cash is X first. Malcolm X first. Then as they work, you live up to your work. And as you are identified and traits are seen that you are manifesting, then out of the mercy of God and his messenger gives you uh, a holy name of your own. So that is the significance, you know, of why a good name is really better 
than gold because it has meaning and you can put that meaning to exchange as a principle in the universe and get from the universe everything that you want and desire of good. Brother Nuri, there are gonna pe be people that are, gonna, that are unfamiliar with you. They're gonna Google your name and they're gonna see things pop up on the Anti-Defamation League or the Southern Poverty Law Center. Right. Where they classify the NOI as a hate group, say anti-Semitic, uh, bigots, hate mongers. How do you respond to those accusations? Liars. No, you expect that, you know. And, and the real truth is my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he said once, he said, you don't measure the weight of a man by his friends, you measure the weight of a man by his enemies. So if, as Paul said, be, 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 be careful and mindful when all men speak well of you. Something ain't right. You're, you're supposed to offend the wicked. You're supposed to offend uh, wrongdoers. The Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center, they are all, have always been anti-black. My name might be on the list and some other members of the nation is on their list, but I want you to go and look at the names that used to be on their list. Do you know Oprah Winfrey's on the ADL's anti-Semitic list? Wow. Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King Jr. was on the ADL's list. You can, you can go down the math and see that some of the, uh, how can you say it? I don't want to say it. Non-threatening even, yeah. friendly. Uh, but so what makes you put somebody on the Anti-Defamation League hit list? It's whenever you see somebody that has some degree of influence that may sway the people's mind in a direction you don't want their mind to go. The reality is that black people are the true Jews of the scripture. We are the real people of God's choice. That is, that is the facts. You can compute it mathematically, you can use history, genealogy with scripture, and you'll find that the chosen people of God that were promised in the book of Genesis 15 and 13 describes black people in America. How do you know? Abraham, is what it says. Know of a surety, Abram, your seed is gonna be a stranger in a land that's not theirs and they're gonna serve a nation and be afflicted by a nation for 400 years. Well, first of all, first of all, Abraham was a black man. How do you know? When Abraham was in Egypt, they said that he was mistaken for being an Egyptian in Romans. Well, how could you be mistaken for being an Egyptian? Egypt is in Africa. The word Egypt comes from the Greek word Aeptis, meaning land of the black and burnt skinned people. So if Egypt was the land of black and burnt skinned people and they thought Abraham was one of them, he had to have black and burnt skin too. So the seed of Abraham, the seed of a black man is going to be black people. They're going to be in bondage according to the scripture for 400 years in a strange land that's not theirs. Well, Jesus was talking to the uh, Jews of his time. And when he told the Jews, he said, you shall know the truth. And truth shall make you free. You know what they said? How shall we be made free? We've never been in bondage to any man in the eighth chapter of John. So if you've never been in bondage to any man, but the prerequisite for being the chosen people of God is you've got to be the seed of Abraham, a stranger in a land not yours, and be a slave for 400 years. You're saying you've never been in bondage to any man. These Jews in America, the Caucasian Jews, they're not black. So you're not black. You're not a stranger in the land, not sure. You've never been a slave, so you're disqualified for being the people of God. But what about us? So when you have a people that have bargained around the world, showing themselves to be something that they're not, we are the victims of identity theft. Brother Nuri, is, is, is it still a nation's stance that they're willing to debate any of their detractors and, and provide I guess, proof and research to their theology and their beliefs? The minister said we've passed the time of a debate. The only thing we can meet you for is a showdown mm. at this point. Gotcha. And they don't want 
to have that showdown because they would have to do it in the same public forum that they've been demonizing and lying all these years. And they know that we've got the evidence, we have the truth uh, on our side, and they don't want us to bring to the table their book that they follow called the Talmud, that they follow with the discipline and loyalty that they follow or should be following the Torah that came from Moses. And what you find in the Talmud of what, what they think about black people, about the, the uh, right to rape a black girl, and there's no consequences because she's not, she's subhuman, that's in their Talmud that they say they follow and believe in. They know we got the facts. Do you know the term son of a bee came from them describing Jesus? Ask a Jew, do they believe in Jesus? They don't believe in Jesus at all. They call Mary Hadia in the Talmud, which means whore. So she is a whore and Jesus is a SOB. Most of them won't even say the name Jesus. They are calling J man in some of their books that they write. So they know we got the goods. We got the facts. So there ain't no time. I mean, we we not getting ready to have no dialogue at this point. It's time. It's showdown time. Got now, they not ready. They're not ready for a student. Of the menacer and they sure can't handle the menacer. But if they ever really want to have, you know, a showdown. Then uh, set that stage, pay per view. Gotcha. Pay -per -view. Coming out of the red corner. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, we're gonna get out of here. I appreciate your time. Thank yes, you sir. So much. Thank you, sir. If you could help me define black manhood in 2021, because when I turn on TV, it's about how many women you bet, how much alcohol you can consume, how much weed you can uh, put in your lungs. If you can help me understand or give me a definition of black manhood, and what advice would you give me, somebody that's going home to coach the young man? I'm in the gym with them, but I don't want to just hand them over to an oppressive system. Right. Man, what a good question. Um, you know, it's something that when you say manhood and I'm looking at the beautiful shirt that you have on right now, it's a hoodie. Yes, what does a hood do? See, a hood is a piece of fabric that covers the head. So how does one acquire manhood? They have to have a specific knowledge covering their mind that makes them into a man. Most of us call ourselves men, but we're really just males. Without that knowledge of how to maintain, protect, and provide for our women, our children, and our community, we really aren't a man by the divine definition that God gave us. So our job, brother, brother William, is he gave us power and dominion over the fish of the sea that follow the air and every creeping thing that crawls. He told us to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. Do you know the word replenish means to replace with something better? So we are called as, as parents, male parents, we're called father. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, if you look at the word father, it sounds just like the word farther. Because the job of a father is to make sure his children go farther in life than he was able to go. So manhood is one that has that knowledge, wisdom and understanding covering his mind that will make him a good maintainer, protector and a provider for his wife his children, his community, and he has the skill set, not just to plant a seed and be a daddy. See, a daddy is one that knows how to put the sperm in a vaginal tract and a child can be born from that seed. But there's a difference between a daddy and a father. A father is one that knows how to train that child, how to successfully navigate in the world he brought him into. So now we've got maintain, protect, provide, and then we have the skill set to make sure our children can go farther than what we've gone. And it doesn't stop there, Brother William, because you're my brother. I'm your brother. If I'm your brother and you're my brother, 
then my son is your nephew and your daughter is my niece. So now I assume the responsibility and role in the community that I live in, in the nation that I'm a part of, that every black man I see, that's my brother. Every black woman I see, that's my sister. So every child I see is my niece or my nephew. Now that's manhood. We don't need a mentor program. We all should be mentoring as uncles. And, and you'll find that sometimes a child can get a message better from their uncle than they can from their own father. Because it's, the, it's in the nature, it seems like, of a child, especially a teenager, when they're trying to go from boy to man or girl to woman, it's almost like there's a firewall or record in their brain. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And it's like that they don't want to listen to, to mom and daddy no more. So mom and daddy can say certain things, but it don't have the, the effect no more because in their mind, I'm trying to be my own me. I ain't trying to do everything. I ain't trying to be just like you do everything. You, uh, you've been using, you tell me what to do all the time. Firewall. But when uncle come and say, same thing mom and daddy been saying. He like, yeah, I never really seen it like that. That's good point. So that's our role. Our role, maintain, protect, provide, take our children farther and then assume the responsibility of being uncles to all of our nieces and nephews, which represents every black child in this nation and doing our part to help them get where they're trying to go as their uncle. Yes, sir. All right, Brother Nuri Muhammad, thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you, sir. We out here. Let's get out of here. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you, brother.